Hi, um, my name is Rory Kennedy, and I'm one of the hosts for today's screening. Oh, that's so nice of you. Anyway, what an amazing film. Um, so I'm just going to speak very briefly. Um, it's really an honor for me to host this screening today because I'm such a huge fan of Navalny. Um, as I'm sure many of you here know, there are a lot of pretty exceptional documentaries that have come out in the last year, but to me, this film, Navalny, really stands out for a number of reasons. Um, I think that one is that it's a fantastically well-told story. Um, it's well-crafted, and uh, I think the filmmaking team really did a, a, an exceptional job in, in pulling this film together and all the different elements of it. Um, to me, this film also stands out because of the courage of the, the people in the film, Navalny in particular, um, as well as the filmmaking team who created this documentary. Um, I think we all know that the stakes are enormously high and that uh, the people who make films along these lines are at great risk for themselves. And so personally, I just want to acknowledge and recognize what the filmmaking team is doing in, in creating this film and putting it out in the world and, and the bravery and courage that is associated with that. Um, and then I think the, the other thing that makes this film stand out is, is really the stakes. Um, and I think that they, they couldn't be higher. Um, and I think that this film has had a lot of impact over the last year and, and I think will continue to have great impact moving forward. Um, my understanding is that Putin cares about three things. He cares about winning the war in Ukraine. He cares about Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> and he cares about the Academy Awards. Um, and so, you know, the I, I think that this film getting elevated will send a very powerful message. And it's not just to our filmmaking community and to the people here in LA, but it's a message that resonates the world over. And so to me, um, the stakes just couldn't be higher, as I said. So. I'm really happy to, to be here today and, and to be in any way connected with this film. And um, it's now my great honor to introduce Ben Rhodes. Um, ben is a political consultant. Um, he's also a, a foreign policy analyst. He's often on seen on MSNBC and NBC. He's also the co-host of Pod Saves America which I kind of think it did, um, uh, particularly during those Trump years, so I appreciate all of your, your work on that. Um, and he will then introduce the, the filmmaking team and folks who are in the film. But um, again, thank you all for being here, and here's Ben. Thanks, Ray. Um, well, look, I, I want to get right into the conversation, but thank you, Roy, for uh, your support of this movie, and uh, I uh, echo everything you say. Um, with that, though, I want to bring out, uh, once again, our director, uh, Daniel Rohr, um, the producer, Diane Becker, and Christo will find out if his wife actually watched the movie. It's not Diane. Oh, it's not Diane. Sorry, oh, Odessa, yeah, I had the wrong list. Hey, Dan. Good. Good to see you guys. Uh, uh, I, want to, uh, I want to jump right in with you. Um, I, I saw an early... I saw this before it came out, and it, it was, um, uh, you know, I, I got, I've been in contact with Alexei Navalny a bit, and it was, it was such a blast to see this um, in the context that it came out. And I wanted to ask you: This is obviously, you were let in at the most kind of pivotal moment imaginable in his life, and there's a clock kind of ticking down that we know as viewers the end of the story, at least as it relates to his arrest. Um, how did you bear the weight of kind of the responsibility of putting together this story knowing that he was going to be getting on a plane and going back to Moscow and probably going to be arrested? Well, when we were shooting the film, we understood that we had a compressed timeline. 
we knew that our guy was going to be leading and as the director of the film what that indicates to me is that I have seven more days six more days five more days before he is gone and inaccessible to us for the rest of production and I think what that created was an atmosphere of just like fever dream craziness to shoot this movie and get whatever we needed it was six weeks of sleepless nights and you know 22 hour days where we were sort of understaffed but hauling ass because we understood the magnitude and i think that navalny saw what we were doing and appreciated how hard we were working and to his credit he was a really great subject here was a subject who was very interested in the filmmaking process. Navalny was very curious about how the cameras worked or how, or how the editing would go or what I was thinking about as I was shooting and crafting the, the, the cinematography, the shooting portion of the film. And that really empowered everything. That generosity of spirit and that curiosity is why we were able to gain such extraordinary access. It was because of Navalny. Yeah, that, I wanted to, to follow up about this question of, of trust, and, and Christo, you're obviously at the center of this, but uh, an operation that has to be distrustful um, and suspicious in order to survive, um, how did, you obviously didn't have a lot of time to, to build this trust, but how did you guys essentially start as outsiders um, and really it felt like from watching this become fully embedded and a part really of, of this operation that Navalny had built? Uh, how did you navigate building that trust? Well, I'll, I'll give you my uh, recollection. I'm sure that it's probably somewhat different from Daniel's and that's his perspective. But I, I knew that they wanted the information that I had. Um, so I kind of sold myself as the uh, sort of foray into their world, uh, which is very um, skeptical of outsiders for, for good reason, as we saw, because he had just been poisoned. And uh, long story short, I told both him and Maria said, give these guys a chance to start filming now, and you can decide later if they're the right guys, the right team or not. Daniel may look like a guy who did a film on on a musician and never did something as sophisticated as following the intricacies of a political thriller, but how about you just let him be a fly on the wall and then we'll talk about it later. And I think this was a great recipe because over the next weeks, uh, it allowed for everybody to know each other, and um, and it was too late to say no after that, right? Yeah, and I'll add to that that I think they really, as you see in the film, they needed Christo. You know, they they knew that he was the one that could help them sort of crack this, and Christo said, "Well, these are my guys. I trust them." You know, he vouched for us, and so when we went into the Black Forest to have this initial conversation with Maria and Alexei. Um, we were just like, listen, you know, let's just let's just try this. We had camera equipment with us. We're like two days in, two weeks in. If you don't like it, we'll quit and we'll give you all the footage. And it was day by day like that that we built the trust. And, and, and crucially, it was like I, we told them, if we miss this moment, then this film will never happen, whether with these guys or not. So let's capture the moment. And they, they understood that. Right? What, one of the things interesting to me in watching this, uh, and I guess this gets to also the strategy for how you, uh, some of the really amazing shots in the, in the movie. This is a documentary filmmaking outlet uh, in its own right. You know, Navalny is famous for the documentaries he's produced. These are people that film everything, uh, that tell stories, and you're kind of entering into an existing, you're not just making a documentary about Alexei Navalny, you're, you're entering into an existing kind of production company uh, of, of, of Navalny's operation. And it seemed like you played with that a little bit because you, you showed people with their phones. How did you think about you know, being a director coming into an operation like that? That's an excellent observation and question. And I think it speaks to uh, the very first conversation we even had with Navalny. And in that conversation, it was our job to convince him what, uh, what was the difference between what we were bringing to the table, making a documentary versus the YouTube uh, type of stuff that they had made before. They were great on YouTube. If you need like a 25 minute YouTube video made, they're your guys. And Navalny, to his credit, is a phenomenal media strategist. He really understands and appreciates the value of uh, social media. This is perhaps his great genius, is his ability to tap into these modern resources. But he'd never really thought about cinema. And when I met with him the first time, 
what I sort of explained to him is in terms of the difference between a YouTube video and what we were anticipating are twofold. First and foremost, what we were trying to do is on a time delay. So it doesn't come out in a week or a month, it comes out in a year, perhaps in a year when you're languishing in a prison somewhere and you would need some sort of thing to anchor your plight to. Well, this could be, this could be a, something that you can have events all around the world in your name to keep you in the global consciousness. The time delay was the first thing. And the second thing is that you watch a YouTube video and you know you may, you may find it charming or humorous and the, the information might sit with you, it might not. But I told him, if we do this right, when people watch this movie, they won't forget it and they won't forget you. And they won't forget the anxiety and the feeling of what it was to watch the film, the emotional response. Um, and I think that part was a little bit too artsy fartsy for him. <laughs> um, but ultimately, he got a sense of what we were trying to achieve, and we started filming. Well, I, there was a third thing you told him, and I think that was even more important than the first one, which was that if he makes the film about himself, it will be a biased film. And you said, I have to make the film about you, and you have to give me final cut on everything I want to have in this film, and there will be uncomfortable questions. And that's fine. And I think he got that one ultimately, right? That, that's a difficult discussion. When you sit in front of a potential subject, from my point of view, I'm trying to let get this guy to let me in. That's my objective. And he has to protect himself. So this guy comes in from the cold, uh, the three of us, and I'm asking him for editorial control. He doesn't give up editorial control. And I, I explained And that him, conversation came up on that first meeting. Yeah. On the very first meeting, the, they called it veto power. They didn't really know what Final Cut was, but they kept using the term veto power. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and what I said, I tried to take a line that was collaborative but strong, and I told them in that meeting that there is, uh, it's our prerogative to make sure you guys are happy with this film. We want you to support it. But there's the conductor of a symphony and the captain of a ship and the director of a film, and I'm the director of the film. And you can hire someone to make your movie, but that's not what I have on offer. What I'm offering you is that I will kill myself to make the best possible movie. And I think Navalny was charmed by that speech, and, and he bought in. And Maria, who you remember from the film, was like, fuck this guy. <laughs> um, but we started filming the next day, and um, you know, the rest is history. W one thing that's... Uh kind of painful to watch right is that i think we're somehow conditioned uh maybe because of you know how most movies go or, or how history was going until relatively recently that when there's a huge um breakthrough like you know this guy getting nailed on the phone call or when crimes or repression is is filmed that it's somehow there's going to be a happier ending or somehow people are inoculated by the fact that they're being filmed and, and actually this connects to like how many cameras and camera phones are in the, the film that there's something not to be to point to the dark side of this but there's something kind of chilling about the fact and i think it raises questions christopher for journalists like what what happens when you you make the most successful sting operation possible but nothing really happens uh to alter the course of the story of navalny's gonna end up in prison how do you guys think about that reality as you're as you're telling this story and as you're as you're doing your continued work uh, in journalism? Well, I would disagree with you that nothing happened. I mean, that, well, we don't see the kinetic outcome of a regime falling, but it changed the understanding of I would say sixty percent of Russians who were previously skeptical that their government is really as evil as Navalny saying as. Uh, the New York Times was saying it changed their perception. It didn't make them braver. I mean, it briefly did, but it made them more aware of the of the evilness of the monstrosity of their regime. And I think that's a major change. That's that's yeah. a, a great leap. And courage comes later. Yeah. No, I, it's a great answer because um, the story's not over, right? Um, and and the, I'm curious about you know the. Part of what is so haunting in the film is the relationship between him and his family, um, which kind of comes back and forth into this political storyline. Um, we talked about Navalny trusting you. Um, how was it to get, uh, particularly Yulia and Dasha, who appear uh, on camera? They must have had, you know, an interesting perspective on these are their final moments potentially for a long time at least with someone they clearly love and who loves them. And they, rec they, they embraced, really, it seemed, maybe not embraced, but they at least 
accepted uh, the, the benefit of being filmed. How did you build trust with that? Um, well, actually, Dasha came home for Christmas holiday, and that was the only time that she was actually present in with the film team. And she was she became actually one of our great allies because she's a student at Stanford. She's interested in film. Um, I think her she's always had an interest in going into film. So she was really excited that there were this documentary team when her dad told her about them and 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 you know would sort of help facilitate like well why don't we invite them over here why don't we invite them which was great and then Yulia you know she's a really lovely person and I think that she's someone who has to be and you can see in the film that is always looking at the bigger picture and she's always taking that into uh, account everything that they do and I, she recognized that this was an important moment and that things were unfolding. And of course they had their days where they were like, this is our day, we're, we're going off, we're doing things as a family, you guys are not invited. But when we were around, you know, she's, she was lovely and hospitable and supportive as she is, just supportive of him. And they've obviously seen this, uh, and he, I presume, has not, Alexei, right? Uh, he, that's one of the saddest parts about this for me, yep. is that he's never gotten to see the movie. Oh. And that sucks. Mm -hmm. And theoretically, he might never see the movie. That's I like I like to imagine the future where I get to go to Moscow, and we rent out the finest cinema, and he and I, we sit there, invite a couple of our buddies, we can have some friends, and we sit there and we show them the movie. It's a very different world, but I like to think that that's the world that Navalny's thinking about as he languishes in solitary confinement in a very small prison cell in a gulag six and a half hours outside of Moscow where he's living now, trying to live now. Um, I think it's the hope for the future. You, you must imagine that that is a compelling force that, that motivates him every day, um, and I hope for that too. But in the meantime, the material reality of his life is very, very sad. And I think what we can all do to help him and his plight and the plight of Russian democracy is to amplify his message and is to amplify the, the story. Um, and for me as the director, that is giving you all homework and telling you to, to tell five of your friends to watch this movie. Because I believe there's a correlation between Navalny's um, uh, notoriety, his fame, his, his existence within the global consciousness um, and his survival. Yeah, there's. Uh, I just want to echo that, and Lori made this point, but this film is excellent, uh, uh, obviously in its own right. It's also the case, it is true that the more profile it gets and um, the more platform it gets, um, the more it kind of keeps alive uh, the people that want to believe inside of Russia and out in this other Russia that Alexei Navalny represents um, versus a, a, a regime that wants everybody to forget that he exists. So uh, please do uh, continue to, to, to lift up this film. I wanted to ask you guys, you clearly, you know, uh, became um, invested in this incredibly powerful story. Um, you can see the emotions on your face, uh, Christo, when he's being uh, detained at the airport. Have you kept up with people like Maria and Leonid? Do, do you feel like uh, unlike probably most films or some films you might work on that that you've kind of joined um, this kind of peculiar extended family that the Navalny operation is? Absolutely. Um, I totally, we feel like family relatives, relations in a way, um, which is odd compared, well, given the skepticism with which this family uh, became extended. Um, yeah, we doesn't mean we are on the same page politically on every issue, but it is exactly like an extended family. We we call each other and find out what what we're working on and if we can help with the investigation of what they're doing. Conversely, Marie is always available to help with any of my investigations. So yeah, that that's the outcome. And your work continues and on, on, oh. on this beat, and, and unfortunately, there's no lack of things for you to investigate. Right? There's a war. Yeah. Well, yeah. And one thing that I just want to speak to is twofold. These are my headline notes. First and foremost, Alexei Navalny is in solitary confinement, as I mentioned. And it's important that we know why he's there. He's specifically there, plucked out of the general prison population and placed in a solitary confinement cell because he is the loudest anti-war voice in Russia. He and his organization are doing everything they can to end this war and to defeat this regime. 
and that's why they uh, have put him in solitary. That's the first thing. And the second thing is, I think just last week, Christo was added to Russia's most wanted list. So the Russian government is officially looking for him, and that has severe security implications for Christo and his travel, his freedom of movement, and it is a direct result of Christo's extraordinary work um, over the last eight months during this horrendous war. Well, that yeah, I wanted to, to end by um, asking about the war, but I, I do just want to note, uh, Christo, that is, uh, you know, weighty responsibility you've taken on. Uh, I was always shocked what you guys convey in the film about Navalny's sense of humor in the face of his own circumstances. The the last communication I had with him uh, was shortly before he went back, and I, I was texting him uh, some questions and, and kind of asking around, why are you going back? Uh, and I'd been spied on by some private intelligence people, black cubers in the news, and he just joked, he said, Ben, my advice to you is just to think about yourself. <laughs> just watch out for black cube. I'll be fine, you know? But that was his, like, I mean, it was insane. Like, I have no risk compared to him, right? I mean, is that, do you, did you, uh, I guess in the, con to, to, to wrap this up, in the context of what's happened since this came out, multiple sentences put on Navalny, solitary confinement, and then the war in Ukraine, which the movie kind of eerily foreshadows because anybody who would be willing to do this it doesn't care about international opinion or human life. Um, ha has, does this, has it changed how, has the war in Ukraine changed how you all think about this film and its message? Does it look different given how much um, this has all become front and center in, in everybody's life around the planet um, given the consequences of the war? Well, I mean, it's it has two um, edges, this sword. Um, on one hand, it kind of has a we told you so uh, component, because that's what we are warning about. On the other hand, the, again, the monstrosity of the war and the um, scale of the human losses in Ukraine make it more difficult for us to highlight just the one man uh, drama that, that this one is. So it takes more effort to explain the interplay between this and that but we have to do that because there is clear as you see clear interplay I mean this this the reason why things like this were allowed to happen by the cumulative West is because is, is the reason why Putin thought he could get away with war and to that I would I would say that um, there's this moment in the movie when uh, Navalny and Christo meet for the first time and Christo is briefing Navalny and Navalny has this observation, he says, wow, he solves his problems with murder. That's how Vladimir Putin solves his problems with murder. And that is this foreshadowing moment that we now know is this egregious, horrible, bizarre war. Um, he is solving his problems with murder. And just to add to the sentencing, just for clarification, because at the end it says facing 20, he's now been sentenced to about 13 and a half years and he's facing, I think, almost another 15 years coming up for starting an extremist organization. Yeah. Well, uh, Lane, I saw Lane at Volkov uh, in Europe recently, and his comment to me was, uh, um, one man is gonna die before the other, either Vladimir mm -hmm. Putin's gonna die and Alexei's gonna get out of prison, or, you know, and that, yeah. that's the, the reality. But look, I, it's an extraordinary piece of work. Uh, it's an extraordinary film in its own right, and it's an extraordinary, uh, contribution to the kind of impossibly high stakes political realities that we live in. So congratulations to you, Dan and, and Odessa and uh, Christo for your work. Uh, uh, we really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you all. so much for doing Thank, Thank you all. And I believe there's a reception.